visiting with us, uh, welcome. We're glad to have you with us today. And um, last week we started a new series of messages entitled, Jesus Said What? And what we're looking at are some of those hard sayings of Jesus, some things that he said that we have to kind of step back and think, oh, wait a minute. Jesus, what did you mean by what you just said? You know, what does that mean and how does that apply to our lives? And so this morning we're going to be looking at this thing, and I took it out of Mark, where it talks to the effect of that we are to lose our life in order to save it. So how do you lose something to actually gain it, to have it, to save it? And that's what we want to take a look at this morning. And as I was studying this, it was very interesting that this saying is very important. It actually occurs three different times in Jesus' ministry. In other words, he said this thing three different times. Same, same, same words. The first time was when he was getting ready to send out his disciples. He had commissioned them in Matthew chapter 10, the 12, and he said, I'm going to be sending you guys out, you know, to proclaim and to tell other people about me and about the good news. And as he did this, he gave them a bunch of instructions. If you look in Matthew chapter 10, he lists a whole bunch of things there. And he talks there in that section that, you know, we have to love him more than our own families. And those, I mean, it's, it's huge. And then he comes up and he tells them, listen, guys, you need to understand that if you're going to save your life, you're going to have to lose it. And he just mentioned that right there to them. And then we come to this section in Mark chapter 8, verse 35, and it's parallel. If you, if you look, it's also in uh, Matthew 16 and in Luke chapter 9. And it takes place uh, just about a week before the transfiguration took, took place. And, and if you just read through um, this section, go up ahead a little bit, you'll see this is where Jesus was talking to his disciples and he asked them, who do people say that I am? Who am I? And, um, you know, some said, well, you're Elijah, you're, you know, the, no, 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 but who do you think I am? You remember what Peter said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. And it was like, wow. And in Matthew, Jesus goes in there and he just commends Peter for saying, you know, hey, you, you know, flesh and blood didn't tell you this, it was the Holy Spirit, way to go, you're, you're great, you're doing fantastic. And then right after this, this is the first time uh, leading up to, you know, Jesus' death, he proclaims that he is actually going to die. Uh, and he talks about that. He says, I'm going to be going into Jerusalem and they're going to, you know, take me and they're going to kill me. And what was Peter's response to that? It was like, no way. We're not going to let this happen. I mean, we just find out that you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're going to set us free from this tyranny of the Romans and set up your kingdom and things are going to be great. You are not going to die. And what was Jesus' response back to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. I mean, whoa. I mean, just this reversal. I mean, just prior to this, he said, Peter, you're doing fantastic. You know, you know who I am. And then just flips and says, Peter, you're acting like Satan. You're trying to do your will and not God's will. And then as he says that, then he jumps in to this whole thing here of what we're going to be looking at this morning, of what it really means. And then what we have is the third time that he mentions it, it's actually after the triumphal entry that they're now in Jerusalem, just the last week of Jesus' life. And again, he comes up and he says to them, um, the whole idea here, he talks of, of a sea falling into the ground and that it has to die before it can come up and, and produce life. And it's like, Guys, you need to understand that for you to really live, to really live, you have to die. And it's like this whole idea is, is coming out here. And so we see that this has to be something really important that Jesus is trying to get across. And so what is he meaning by this? What is he trying to convey to us? And if you look at each and every one of these circumstances where he mentions this, it all deals with what does it really cost you to follow me, to be my disciple. And each and every case, it, it deals with that. So somehow or another, this saying has to deal with the cost of being a disciple. 
There's something important here for us to grab a hold of. So let's just kind of go through this passage and we'll pick it up. And so he comes in and he begins by telling them this. And then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Now, in the Greek, and if you look in maybe different translations, where it says um, that, you know, if you want to be my disciple, it literally there says, if anyone wishes or desires to come after me, if you really want to be my disciple, if you want to be my apprentice, if you want to be like me, Come after me. This is what you have to do. And what does he say? What are the three things we have to do to be his disciple? He makes it very clear. He says to be his disciple, first of all, you must deny yourself. Now, here we have to be really careful because when we talk of this, you know, sometimes we think of this idea of self-denial. Um, it's kind of like... Well, okay, you know, I, I may be trying to lose a little weight here, and so I'm not going to be eating any Tim Horton donuts for the next month, all right? I'm going to deny myself, all right, and not eat those things. That's, that's kind of this idea of, of it, and we kind of pick this up, but no, no, no. What Jesus is saying here goes way beyond that. He is actually saying in a sense that we have to renounce our self, and by our self, it's, it's who and what we are. Um, one of the kind of time, um, commentators I was reading, he says, he says, we need to cease to make self the object of one's life and action. You understand that? In other words, I am not living for me. My life does not revolve around me, about what I can accumulate, what I can have, what I can do. It's not about my life it's not about my actions in other words I am denying myself I am renouncing myself and he clarifies this by this next phrase he says what we have to deny ourselves and then we have to take up our cross daily now today we kind of come up with this idea that you know if, if we're in a tough relationship with somebody else we kind of say, well, well, that's my cross to bear, you know. I mean, it's just kind of a, it's, it's an irritation, it's tough. That's not at all what he's referring to. He's not saying it's some burden or some irritation that we have in life, but he's basically saying it's this idea of dying. In his day, if somebody were to say, you're going to be taking up your cross, what that meant was you were going out to be executed. In other words, it was a one-way trip. You weren't coming back. Uh, it was very common in that day. Um, we see pictures of Jesus carrying the whole cross. So that may have been, but the historians are now saying it's probably just the cross beam that they would carry on their shoulder. And they would carry that out to the place of execution and then that's where they would die. And so Jesus is very clearly saying, listen, the cost of being my disciple is you have to be willing to die. To die. And it's like, whoa, that's huge. But it's interesting, because as I study this, it's, it's in the sense of, of being in the aorist tense in the Greek, which basically means, okay, it happens once and for all. But he's saying what? That we have to take up our cross daily. And I'm going like, wait a minute, how do you do that every day? And I think what Jesus was trying to bring across here is, listen, we struggle every day with this issue. And he's saying, listen, when you get up first thing in the morning, one of the first things you need to do is decide, okay, Jesus, I am taking up your cross today. I am dying to my own self, all right? To, to, you know, to making things revolve around me. Today, I'm going to be living for you. Okay, there's a huge difference there. And we have to do that every morning, every day we have to make that decision. It's not about me. It's not about my life. Jesus, today it's about you. It's about you. Okay? I take up your cross today. And then the third thing he says that we need to do is that we need to follow him. And along with this idea, yes, it's this idea that we need to become more and more like him. We need to, you know, we need to follow him. But I think it carries with us this idea that we need to obey and apply his teachings to our life. 
in, in that sense that we're following him. Yes, we're becoming more and more like him as we obey and as we follow him. And then he goes on from here, and, and this is where he now comes into this whole part of he talks about saving your life and losing it. But you have to grab this first because to understand what he's going to be talking about next, this is paramount. Because he goes on and he says what? For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And if you look in the NIV, there's a little bracket there, you know, that B thing where it says life. And the reason for that is that the Greek word could mean life or soul. And it's the Greek word that we use. It's called psyche. It's, it's our inner being. It's who we are. And, and that word is used all the way through, you know, all three of those verses. It's that idea. It's, it's this, this is who we are. And so he's saying, if you really want to save who you are, what do you have to do? You have to lose who you are. And I'm going like, okay, what do you mean by that? Well, in Jesus' day, it basically meant for some of them of giving up their physical life, that they would not deny Christ. And so because of that, they gave up their physical life, in a sense, what? To gain eternal life. They would not denounce Christ. They wouldn't do that. And today, that is still happening around the world, that there are some places where people have to make that decision. Deny Christ and you'll live. And if you don't deny Christ, we will kill you. And so they choose not to deny Christ. They give up their life, physical life, so that they can have eternal life in that sense. But today, for most of us, we may not face that situation where we have to actually die physically. But it carries with it again this whole idea of denying ourselves. Then again, we no longer live for us. But what does Jesus say? It's for him and for his gospel. Why are we here? What's our purpose in life? We talk about Alpha and coming up. Why are we here? Is it just for us to get the most of what we can out of this life? And what does Jesus say here? Guys, you're missing the boat here. If you're just here to grab all the gusto you can, it's not worth it. It is not worth it. Your soul, who you really are, is so much more valuable than anything, anything that this world could offer to you. Grab a hold of that. You are more valuable than anything else in this world. So don't try and grab those things. No, 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 no. He says instead, yeah, give your life over to God completely. It's for his sake that we are here. And then he kind of comes and he makes it in a practical sense. Like, okay, listen, you may not have to give your life physically for me, but here's the thing where it really comes out, and it's this. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his Father's glory with the holy angels. As I thought about that, why are we sometimes ashamed to be identified with Jesus? Why are we sometimes ashamed to really say what we believe? You know, to to talk to other people about the gospel. Why are we fearful of doing that? And I think it comes down to this. You know, this idea that if we're not ashamed, Jesus is saying, hey, if you're not ashamed, it's proof that you're no longer living for yourself. So you can see, if we're ashamed, we're afraid of what? Rejection of what people may think of us. Uh, Maybe even a promotion at work. I was reading one of my devotionals a couple weeks ago of where a man um, was in this company and um, he and his boss were going out for lunch together and his boss said to him, listen, I have really noticed that that you are different than a lot of my other employees, guys that work with us. What makes you different? So you know what he did? He told them. He said, it's because Jesus Christ is living in my life. It's because I have committed my life to serving and following him. Well, guess what happened? From that day forward, the boss just kind of backed away from him. 
a promotion came up, he didn't get it. And it was like he was given the grunt's work of things to do. And so he actually went to his boss and he asked why. And his boss's comment was, if somebody, you know, is so religiously minded in that way that they're so narrow-minded, I can't have them in my company. And so basically he pushed this guy out. Why? Because he wasn't ashamed of the gospel. And I think this whole area of rejection is huge. And I don't want to gloss over this. I mean, this, this, this is a major thing that I think we face all the time. Because we don't want to be rejected. We don't want that to happen. Because rejection hurts so much. Um, just this morning, in one of the devotionals that I, I get, um, it comes from Faith Gateway. And they're actually going to be doing an online study coming up in about a week dealing with this whole area of rejection. And um, it's called uninvited. In a sense, you didn't get invited to the party, folks. You've just been rejected. Well, how does that make you feel? How do you deal with that? And so it's being led by a lady by the name of uh, Lisa Terkurst. And um, I just want to read to you a couple of things that she said. Now listen to this. And she's talking about rejection. She says, rejection isn't just a complicated emotion. It's an utter devastation of what we thought was real and safe and secure. And it affects us all the way, or all the more than we'd like to admit. We are all either trying to heal from a past rejection, deal with a present rejection, or fear that an unexpected rejection is just around the corner. And in her life, she goes in later on and she talks about that her father um, divorced her mom and actually didn't want to have a daughter and rejected her. And, you know, so she had this whole thing going along. And so she is saying here then, she goes on and she says that rejection isn't just an emotion we feel. It's a message that's sent to the core of who we are causing us to believe lies about ourselves, others, and God. Lies that become a liability in how we think about ourselves and interact in every future uh, relationship. But it isn't just a better feeling that we need. We need a completely new way of defining our identity. We need truth to inform us of what we believe about ourselves. Otherwise, what we believe about ourselves would become fragile, flimsy, and a faulty foundation. The beliefs we hold should hold us up even when life feels like it's just falling apart. So she said, my old patterns of thought had to be torn out and a new way of looking at the core of who I am using God's truth had to be put in its place. I mean, this is a huge thing that she's talking about. She said, our identity must be anchored to the truth of who God is and who he is to us. Only then can we find a stability beyond what our feelings will ever allow. The closer we align our truth with his truth, the more closely we identify with God, the more our identity really is in him. Now, that's a psychological way of saying what? We need to die to ourselves. It's not about us, it's about him. It's making him first in our lives, allowing him to be here. And the reason she says that we can do this, and this is, this is where I just want to close with this. She said this, the central truth in all of this is that we need to understand that we are loved by God. God loves us. Not because of how terrific we are, God doesn't base his affection on our wilted efforts. No, God's love isn't based on us. It's simply placed on us. And it's in the place from which we should live that we are loved by him. You got that? We were celebrating communion this morning, thanking Jesus for what? For dying on the cross for us. That's how much he loves us. And if we understand that, if we live in his love that he has for us, if we make that central in our lives, it's no longer about us. It's about him. And so if somebody rejects you, they're not rejecting you. 
they're rejecting Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about me. And as we realize that we're in his love and we have that love, and as in a sense we die to ourselves, guess what? Let me close with this. You cannot hurt a dead person's feelings. All right? You can't do it, folks. If that person's dead, you can say anything you want to. I mean, it's not going to bother them one bit. Why? They're dead. They're dead. And what is Jesus saying here? Folks, we need to be dead to ourselves. People can say what they want. It's all right. It's no longer I who live, but what? Jesus Christ who lives within me. Do you really want to have life and enjoy it? Lose it. Lose it. Die to yourself. That's what Jesus is saying to us today. All right, let's pray. Team, come on up. Father, tough lesson. Hard. Man, each and every one of us has this fear of of rejection, of not being accepted, not being loved by others around us. And it's so hard. And yet you have told us that we need to die to ourselves, that we need to lose our life so that we can truly gain it. And so, Father, I pray that you will help us to understand that you love us so much, and that's all we need. We just need to know that you love us and that you're here for us, that you have given yourself for us, and that it's not about us, that we just release that, that we no longer live for ourselves. We're not here on this earth for us. We are here for you and for your gospel. And I pray that as we do that, as we make this reality real within our lives, that we will not be afraid of rejection. We will not be ashamed of you or your gospel. So, Father, I pray that you'll encourage our hearts today, that you'll help us to go forth from here, desiring each and every morning to really say, I'm going to take up my cross I'm going to die to myself and it's going to be for you today, Jesus. I am living for you and for you alone. Thank you for your love for me that that's all I need. I don't need anything this world has to offer as long as I know your love for me is there each and every minute of the day. So thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's stand and seal in those words that Pastor Tim just spoke to us as we declare... Jesus, you are Lord of all.
The truth of that song is there for us. Again, it's not about us, it's about him. He is the one who gives us strength. He is the one who has conquered death. He is the one who has saved us and it's all because of him. And so because of that, yeah, we can go forth from here rejoicing. And again, I was just thinking as we were singing that song and the whole idea of not being ashamed. Um, you know, I really love my wife, Grace. I really do, okay? She's not here this morning so I can say this, okay? But here's the thing. I'm not afraid to talk about her to other people. She is a great person. And I'm not ashamed of that at all. Why? Because I love her. And I know that she really loves me. Guess what? I love Jesus. I really do. And Jesus loves me. And it's him living in me. He has given me this new life. So why should I be ashamed? Why should I be ashamed? And again, we need his strength within us to go forth from here. So let me just close with this prayer for you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. For I pray and ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. Go in his love today.